Okay, I am Kathleen Merrigan with the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State. We welcome you, those of you in the room, and those of you who are on the webcast. Uh, this uh, great conversation is being hosted by the Sweetie Center along with NCBA, the National Cooperative Business Association. Um, the idea for this program actually started in a conversation that I had with um, George Seaman, the former CIEIO, I think is how he referred to himself, <laughs> as organ of Organic Valley. And we were regretting the loss of knowledge about the cooperative movement in American agriculture and how meaningful it's been. And I am particularly aware of that because I'm trying to educate the next generation of young leaders to take over important roles in, in food policy and agriculture. And I realize that a lot of them do not know much about cooperatives, what they've meant, how they've operated in the countryside, and, and then also what the potential is for cooperatives. So that's really the genesis of our conversation. And then Doug O'Brien and I talked a little bit more about it and decided that this was an interesting topic worthy of your time and ours, and we really are excited that you could be here today. Um, fortunately, we lost one of our panelists, um, Jerry George from Organic Valley, due to illness. Um, hopefully, he's watching us uh, on the webcast and uh, cheering us on. At some point, I will ping our panelists and ask them the question I would have asked Jerry, which is, are there size implications when you're a cooperative? When you get to be a certain size, Organic Valley now is over a billion dollar farmer cooperative. How different is that than a small cooperative? And are there growing pains we should be aware of? I'm sure our panelists today who are at the, at the um, desk here can reflect on that. But let me first start with um, an introduction of Doug O'Brien, who will lead us off with some overview comments on the cooperative movement. Uh, I will then move on to John and then to Sarah. They're gonna give brief opening remarks, and then I will take the role of moderator and ask them all a couple of questions, and then it will be your turn, and you can ask them what you would. Like, so Doug is the CEO of NCBA, um, and he's been doing that for a couple of years now. Just about. Mm -hmm. A couple of years now. Now, Doug and I go quite a ways back. Um, I remember my first day as Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. I walked in, and Doug O'Brien was there as my chief of staff. <laughs> so <laughs> he, um, he was running my life for a while and did a very good job of that, and then went on to be... Uh, in a number of leadership positions at the, the uh, USDA and at the White House. Um, very significant voice in rural development. He is um, well known in Iowa, Ohio, uh, just generally um, around the countryside and has really done a lot of interesting work in ag law. I could um, tell you more, he may add to his very brief bio there, but it's really great to welcome him here to give us an overview. And Suzanne is indicating what? I'd like you to give him the clicker. Oh, you'd like me to give him the clicker? The control back, controlling my <laughs> life again? I don't know. Thank there you. you. Go. All right. Um, should I jump in? Okay. Go for it. Thank you, Kathleen and Suzanne, um, for this opportunity to talk about. Uh, certainly one of my favorite topics, and that's cooperatives. Um, uh, maybe the only thing that I'll add to the very kind introduction is that I grew up in a farm, on a farm in Iowa. Uh, so co-ops, uh, you know, have been part of my life even when I didn't fully realize it. It's how we got our electricity. Um, it's how we had our telephone connection. Um, and it's how we bought a lot of our inputs. Uh, and how we marketed a lot of our hogs and corn. And, um, and you know, in, in rural places, just as it was in Dubuque County, uh, in when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, Dubuque County, Iowa, uh, a lot of times the only 
the only solution that people uh, have at their disposal to be involved in commerce, to be part of the economy, is co-ops. Um, so I, I want to talk, I'm going to be brief and uh, so we can get to the conversation, but I just want to talk briefly about well, just the 30-second NCBA, talk about what co-ops are very briefly, uh, and then and then just the history of ag co-ops in the United States of America. I should be done in about two and a half minutes. The, um, uh, so NCBA, CLUSA, National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International office, literally on the eighth floor, you can see our library, if you look right over there, kitty corner. We are the apex or umbrella association for all kinds of co-ops in the United States. We've been around for 103 years. We do advocacy, public awareness, thought leadership, and development. Um, we uh, help cultivate and support the domestic cooperative development community here in the United States. We also do uh, a lot of international development and have for about 65 years, bringing the cooperative principles to developing regions. So that's who NCBA CLUSA is, a membership association, BC kind of kind of thing. Um, so the the you know cooperatives I mentioned at top that they have been a um, a solution for people who are trying to uh, find their way in the economy and 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 we're here to talk about agricultural cooperatives, but I'll just mention rural electric cooperatives briefly before I talk about ag cooperatives because uh, it has some of the I think the most um, stark, but I think the, the agricultural cooperatives have that sharp uh, story and narrative too. Rural electric cooperatives in 1932, 10% of the farm households in the United States of America had access to electricity, 10%. And um, about 90% of people who lived in cities had access to electricity at that time. Um, FDR created a program actually initially to get the investor-owned utilities to participate and distribute and generate electricity out into the countryside, but they sharpened their pencils and determined that made no sense for them. By this time, broad swaths of the United States uh, rural and the agriculture farmers, they knew about cooperatives. And they knew that there was a solution there, and there was, so they created their own businesses, member owned, member run, benefit the member, uh, and they partnered with the federal government. And within a generation, within about 25 years, 90% of the people, of the farm households in the U.S. had access to electricity. So when we think about transformational change, can things happen fast? They can happen fast. That was, you know, that was a very big deal. And it was because of the cooperative business model and because of public-private partnership. Now, farming, slightly, uh, maybe a little bit longer story. The first ag cooperatives, at least according to the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-ops, the first ag cooperatives were dairy cooperatives in the upper Midwest um, in 1810. And these were farmers from probably Finland, I think, if I remember right, but certainly from Northern Europe, who had become um, very familiar with the cooperative business model. And, uh, and farmers realized that they needed to come together to get to scale, to be able to participate and um, and bargain. Uh, sometimes they had to create their own distribution chains. Uh, and they, they grew steadily throughout the 19th century, but then kind of fast forward to the late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, industrialization was taking full hold. Uh, farmers still populated about half of the United States of America. And they were losing their place, and they were losing their place quickly within the economy. Um, it was at that time in the progressive era, the populist era, that there was both federal legislation and organizing fervor uh, to, to really create those cooperatives through technical assistance, through uh, programs, and then it sort of accelerated uh, in the 1930s when the, you know, when kind of the armies of, of people were brought in to help rural America, in particular farmers, with the 1930s farm programs, and a huge part of that was the creation of cooperatives. In fact, a lot of the early cooperative extension work uh, was used to help farmers create these businesses that they own, that, um, that they control, and that they benefit from. And so I said that a couple times, and maybe I'll, um, I'll just go to a couple slides very quickly, but I want to talk about that business model very clearly. And I want to set it against what is the, you know, the dominant business model today, which is a C corporation, in fact, typically multinational C corporation. It is owned um, by stockholders, primarily institutional investors. Uh, and its primary goal, uh, and sometimes exclusive goal, 
is to bring financial returns back to the stockholders. And that is what a C-Corp does, and they can be very effective at doing that. Uh, what a cooperative does, it is, again, it's owned by the people who use the business. In this case, it's the farmers. It is controlled by those farmers. And the benefits, you know, the profits, or there's different terminology in co-ops, the patronage, um, goes back to the people who use the business. It's a big, big difference. And, and of course, the outcomes that come to the members of that business and to those communities, those local multipliers, you know, are, are much greater. So that's, um, you know, that's what an agriculture cooperative is. Just very quickly, uh, where do I point? Do I point at you? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, just very quickly, here's, here's a map. This also is from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, these are 1917, or, excuse me, 2017 <laughs> numbers. And they're uh, sales, marketing, and production co-ops. Blue Dot, you know, is, is one co-op. About 75% of those blue dots are ag co-ops. Um, that's the, the most of the marketing and, and sales co-ops in the country are agriculture. You can see where the concentration is on the upper Midwest, but then it's sprinkled throughout with, you know, different, different parts um, within, even in the Northeast. Uh, and then a lot of the, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and kind of high value crops in California that they, they use cooperatives in a very, uh, aggressive way in, in, in some different ways, you know, ocean spray and, of course, that's in the northeast in Wisconsin, but uh, Welch's, uh, Sunkist, Florida's Natural, many, if not most, of the, of the brand names are, are cooperatives. So that's where they are. And then the next one, it, hopefully not stealing Sarah's thunder here, but this is from, this is from some CoBank. Um, CoBank's been putting out some, some excellent kind of content these days. On, on lots of things around agriculture, something that came out, I think, a little bit earlier this year, was on, on consolidation. Uh, agriculture cooperatives on, on kind of the, the larger side, it is a pretty mature sector. Uh, agriculture distribution and processing is a pretty mature sector, and what, what you know, we're seeing, as in other sectors, is some, um, some pretty significant consolidation. Uh, just a couple numbers here. Uh, Yes, I do. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> USDA data shows that co-op numbers 65 years ago uh, for ag co-ops are about 10,000, and today there's less than 2,000 of those. Not unlike farm numbers, of course, some of those same. Um, uh, the number of co-op employees nationwide has actually slightly increased since 2005, and the average co-op now employs more than 100 people. So... Actually, those employment numbers are going, the, the share depending on the commodity, but the market share of cooperative businesses and food is typically steady or, or increasing. Um, but the number of co-ops and indeed the, the number of members, which they have to be farmers, um, is, is decreasing. So that's, that is something that uh, is certainly happening in co-ops as well as, as other places. And I think I'm going to finish there and look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists in the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. All right. I'm going to call on John Zippert next. Now, you might think, where's Carol? Because a lot of times John and Carol are together. But they put out a, a newspaper, and she's on the school board and very busy. And John just said to me as we were chatting before this uh, event that he's failed at retirement. <laughs> um, he's very, very busy. But um, many of us know John for many, many years. Uh, for 45 years, he was director of programs for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Rural Training and Research Center. And uh, some people in the room also know he and his wife as um, inductees in the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I really felt it was important for the Federation to be represented on this panel because when I was looking um, some time ago for some good resources for my students on the history of cooperatives. You have the center in Wisconsin that Doug has referenced, but I also found that there's a great library on the Federation's website, and I know that they've tried to accumulate that history and um, specifically thinking about the history of cooperatives um, for uh, organizing and helping black farmers in this country. And so uh, John could probably give us a three-hour plus lecture 
on the history of cooperatives and what the Federation's role is. I'm going to try to cut you back on that, John, because we only have an hour for the entire program. But um, please, share with us some initial thoughts. So um, I, I came to the cooperative movement in a slightly different way and in connection in many ways with the civil rights movement. Mm. And I guess I'm still, and the Federation is still working on the social and economic justice part of cooperatives as our strongest reason for involving people and helping people to use cooperatives. And you've already heard I have a half a century or so of work and experience in this. In 1965, at the age of 18 and some months, I went to uh, work in Louisiana. I, I volunteered for the summer of 1965 to register people to vote in Louisiana with the Congress of Racial Equality. And I went, they, they sent me, and the process was pretty arbitrary. <laughs> uh, I wound up going with four other, three other volunteers to St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. Uh, Opelousas, Louisiana is the county seat it's about 60 miles west of Baton Rouge. And we came to St. Landry Parish, and I learned later that St. Landry Parish in 1960 had the highest number of black farmers and sharecroppers. So we went, you know, to, as volunteers, the, the Voting Rights Act was about to be passed, and we, uh, we were told, well, help people to register to vote, help people who want to integrate public accommodations to do so if they want to do so, and then talk to people about what the things they really want to do. And uh, St. Landry Parish is a pretty rural place. And it turned out that the people who were most interested in civil rights and in working on issues of civil rights were black farmers and black sharecroppers who were working on land that was owned by black people because they had some degree of independence from the economic and political structure. And so, in many ways, those were the people who gravitated towards somebody coming in, uh, talking about the civil rights movement. And as we began talking to people, the thing that people said to me was, well, we aren't getting a f fair price for our sweet potato crops if people are exploiting us. And so we started uh, a study group. I'll call it a study group. It, it took place on Friday night in a, in a juke joint. <laughs> but it was a study group. I, I, I'll say it was a study group. And part of what we learned about was the success of farmers in other parts of this country using co the cooperative as a way to organize and come together and uh, reduce exploitation and get a fair price for their product and do it in a structure that was collectively owned in a democratic way. And, you know, I, I did go to college and I studied economics, but they didn't say much about co-ops. I don't think they still do, to be honest. We're going to change that, John. <laughs> we need to change that. So 
you know, I really learned along with the farmers I sent for information from uh, USDA had a, uh, they had a, I forget exactly what it was called, but they had a division about cooperatives and you could get information and in literature. And then people said to me, well, you know, they have this black Catholic priest not far from you in Louisiana who's doing co-ops. You need to get in touch with Father A.J. McKnight. Well, he was about 30 miles away. I didn't have a car. But eventually, I contacted him, and he showed up one day with two or three people who were working with them. One of them was Carol Prejean. One of them was Charles Prejean. And uh, another one was Alfred Maxiel. And so we started working together in a broader way to develop cooperatives as a way for uh, small farmers and other uh, low-income and struggling people in rural parts of Louisiana to, to make a difference. And as we began doing that, we also got in touch with other cooperatives that were organized by the civil rights movement in Mississippi in Tennessee, in Georgia, South Carolina. In 1967, we had a meeting in Atlanta of 22 of those cooperatives and credit unions, and the people there said, we want to form an organization that can speak for us and they can help us get co-op training, get technical assistance, get marketing, get other support and and so the federation was organized in 1967 we are now in our 52nd year um, there's been a lot of struggles involved with doing that we we have worked primarily with agricultural co-ops we've done mm -hmm. some work with rural credit unions we've also worked with people who make craft Things like uh, we had a cooperative in Alabama called the Freedom Quilting Bee in G's Bend, Alabama. And you know about them because there's been exhibits of their quilts and their uh, traditional art. But really, they we tried to help them form a worker co-op, which lasted for a while. And there's still a chance there are some people now, some of the children and grandchildren of the original members are, are trying to reconstitute it now, and the Federation is helping them. As you suggested, I went to the Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm ready to speak on this for several hours, but I, I'll stop now. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> yeah, you, that was great. You, you left speechless. Me speechless. I've, yeah, I've seen right. that, really. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. All right, so our last um, panelist here, last but not least, is Sarah Tyree. I am um, going to start with something about her you may not know, which is not her official career work, but that she's been really instrumental in D.C. Central Kitchen, which is um, one of uh, my husband and I's favorite charities, and has been involved in the Campus Kitchen Project. So I just want to thank you for um, that, that work that you do. So she's at Kobe. She is overseeing um, telemedicine initiatives, local food initiatives, urban ag projects. Um, and so uh, she's had a variety of careers. Um, many of you know her. She's worked at the Missouri Department of Agriculture. She's worked at Bio. Um, so she's worked on the Hill. Uh, it's great to have you give us a perspective from CoBank. Great. Um, well, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'll start off by telling my story about co-ops. So 
I'm a product of suburbia USA. So my father was in the Air Force and he worked for, he was a chemical engineer, so I moved every three years. I had no idea where my food came from. And so when I came to DC, um, my first introduction to cooperatives was when I met my now husband. He worked for this organization, I never heard of it before, it was the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. I'm like, what is a co-op? I mean, and so, through my husband, I learned about the history of the rural electric cooperatives. Um, and I remember when I first, you know, got my first um, salary job, got um, joined the Congressional Credit Union. And again, I understand it was another, you know, cooperative. And then I ended up living with my great aunt who lived in Southwest DC and she lived in a housing cooperative. And she was a very active board member. And that was something that was um, something instilled with me early on is cooperatives equals meetings, means <laughs> active, <laughs> actively being involved. Um, so that was something I learned from my Aunt Eloise because she was very, very active um, at Harbor Square. And so that was my first introduction. You know, again, um, you know, when I really learned about the power of the cooperative model in agriculture is when I worked for the Missouri Department of Agriculture. So I worked for the Director of Agriculture in the late 90s, and, and at that time, all the talk was added value. Um, commodity prices weren't all that great, and there was a big interest in Missouri to form ethanol cooperatives. And so while I was there, there were three ethanol cooperatives that were developed, and it was a great um, environment from, from my perspective, I mean, I learned all about co-ops through USDA's um, information that they had, you know, just a wealth of information, but it all boiled down to, you know, getting the local farmers organized and getting their buy-in, understanding that, you know, they're stronger together than apart. And one of the things that I was also very excited about working on is during that point in time in the state legislature, um, times were pretty good and we had a lot of tax credits. And we actually had legislation that provided $2,000 of state tax credits for every $2,000 um, a farmer would invest in an ethanol cooperative. Made it pretty nice. So bottom line is, that was my first introduction into not only cooperative, um, you know, ag cooperatives, but also the power of organizing and the power of controlling their own destiny. And that was something really important, excuse me, important to me. Um, you know, flash forward, you know, about six or seven years, um, I ended up working at CoBank. And so CoBank, um, another fabulous cooperative, part of the farm credit system. Um, one of the things that has just been a joy to work with is the support that CoBank is now giving to emerging small farmer and cooperatives. You know, with this growing interest, and it continues to grow every year. I mean, I don't see the Trenton changing, but folks are consciously making the decision to buy more and more local food. I mean, this is a, this is a good thing. Um, I mean, it's, but how do you encourage the farmers that are, are, are tapping into this market to embrace the cooperative model to help them with their needs? And this has just been something that we've seen that's important, and so we started a program called Co-op Start, where CoBank now provides flexible financing up to $250,000 to help with those small emerging cooperatives. Um, and they've ranged from all sorts of things, ranging from a group of antioxidant berries. Um, it just, it's been, it's been very wide ranging, but it's been good. Um, and so, yeah, I again, just wanted to tell you my story about how I was introduced to cooperatives and how, you know, with the work at CoBank, um, with the support that we're doing with, you know, smaller cooperatives, the local food, urban agriculture, just see a lot of potential there. So I'm excited about the future. So um, I'm actually going to skip right to, I told you all I'd ask you two questions. I'm going to skip to my second question, so there's time for all of you to ask questions. And this is it. So in our flyer for this program, I took Doug O'Brien's uh, cue, and we said, is this a cooperative moment? Um, I, throughout my career, have been very close to the dairy industry. I grew up in 
rural part of Western Massachusetts, a lot of dairy, mixed vegetable, cigar wrap, tobacco. Anyhow, um, it's just been devastating to watch the last couple of years what's been happening in the dairy sector. We saw that the Dean Foods uh, uh, filed for bankruptcy today. Um, there's been a lot of struggle in other sectors of American agriculture. Uh, it's, um, it's just disheartening to uh, see the rise in suicides, to see the devastation that's occurred from loss of overseas markets. Um, anyhow, so structure and power in agriculture are questions um, on the minds of young people today. And so I want each of our panelists to reflect um, not so much on what has happened in the past, and we got some good history across the three of you, but looking forward. And the question is, is this a cooperative moment? Is this a time when pulling from the history books, pulling from what we know of both the successes and failures of cooperatives, could this be a structure for strengthening American agriculture going forward? Doug's Can I ready. go first? Yeah, I'm Doug's jumping ready. in a bit. Um, thank, but thanks for that question, Kathleen. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, for turning our heads towards the future. Um, you know, the, the, and I have done some writing you can check out on NCBA CLUSA. Uh, website about the cooperative moment. And by that, what I'm talking about is that we, we look at the history of the United States in particular, or at least that's what my writing is about, uh, that when people feel excluded from their economy or from their society, many times they look to the cooperative business model as a strategy to, for inclusiveness, for being part of it, for being empowered. It happened to farmers at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, which I talked about. Happened to farmers with rural electrics. Happened in the early 20th century in credit unions. Um, you know, now 100 million people in this country uh, own their own financial institution. And 100 years ago, that number was essentially zero. I mean, so, you know, it really changes. So then we get back to agriculture. And a, a way that I think about it is what's what's different now than you know, than what had been or, or than 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And I, I think of two things when we think about ag co-ops and what might be different. One Sarah already mentioned. Was that it, all the meetings? Sorry, go The ahead. meetings. <laughs> um, and I, can, I could riff on the meetings too, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. What, um, one is people have a different relationship with food uh, than they had even 10 years ago, um, certainly 20 years ago. And that's not going to change. Um, exactly what that relationship will look like in the near future. Nobody but Kathleen knows, and she just dribs and drabs, you know, gives us reveals what it's going to be. But, it, but, but we know it's going to be different. You know, people have, they have a different, they want a different relationship with their food and what it, what it takes to bring food to their table. And co-ops can have a huge role. And, and we see both small co-ops as well as some of the larger co-ops are recognizing that. And they're wearing, more and more, they're wearing their co-op identity on their shoulders. Uh, on their sleeves. So I think that's, that's one big difference and in, in one reason we're in a cooperative moment. The other reason is information technology and I'll just say big data. Uh, in, you know, 50 years ago, if you're a farmer, the, the value was in a bushel of corn and a hundred weight of milk. Uh, and, and you use the co-op to either get your best price at the farm gate so you could get to scale and do bargaining, or you might have went up the chain so you could actually get some of the value added over time. But, but really, at the end of the day, the value was in that bushel and maybe a little bit of value added in the processing. These days, there is uh, a lot of value in agriculture in information. In, you know, in the production data, primarily, in the soil, uh, makeup in, you know, you layer that with, uh, uh, with climate and there's, there's an enormous amount of value in all of that information if it's analyzed and manipulated in a certain way. And there are entities that are starting to do that. Uh, most of them are not co-ops. Some of them are. Uh, and, and, you know, farmers, just like consumers in our, 
you know, in our relationship with, um, you know, with, with Google or Facebook or whatever, we freely give lots of value to those folks all the time when we click that little box down at the bottom. And we get some value back, but, but do we get the, the, a fair amount of value? And then in, in that analogy for ag co-ops, farmers are, you know, they're giving up a lot of information to certain entities within their supply chain. Are they really getting the best value? They're getting some value back. They're getting information about production decisions and, and marketing decisions that are really helpful to them, but are they really getting the most of it? And I think that's, a, that's part of the cooperative boom for agriculture cooperatives now is, is ag co-ops really leveraging their cooperative identity to, to create and capture the value for the members or for the farmers as opposed to outside investors. All right, before I um, turn to our other two panelists, I have a follow-up little question. Okay. Just a little teeny uh, okay. one. All right. So it, people have a different relationship with their food. Mm -hmm. We have a proliferation of all kinds of label claims in the marketplace. Right. People are searching yeah. to do good for themselves, to do good for the planet. Yeah. So you also have um, a time when there's the rise of the B Corp. Mm. And uh, I think it's something like 1,500 mm -hmm. companies now are yeah. B Corp certified. Right which um, they hope is a way to signal to consumers um, they're good guys right. and gals. So right. I use guys in a non-gendered way. Right. Um, do you see that uh, co-ops can make a play for that, connect with consumers in the marketplace yeah. uh, in, a, that, in a way that will help build the kind of structures you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, well, I, yes, and I think you know, I can point to, oh, if Jerry was here, I think Jerry could point to Organic Valley, you know, sort of leaning into their co-op identity, telling the story, um, creating trust with their consumers. And I think co-ops can do that more and more. You know, at, at, at the core, co-ops, they, they are, and I've said it again and again, you know, they're owned, they're controlled, and they benefit um, the farmers. And a lot of people care about that more, you know. And, um, and in many times, because the board of directors, which is literally farmers, I mean, it, I've, I've been to them, you've been to a bunch of these, and whether it's, you could name a lot of the, the big co-ops, and there's, there's a bunch of really sophisticated business people who've never spent any time in Wall Street, or maybe none of them have an MBA, but they're farmers, and they're making choices, you know, as a business person, they're also making choices as a member of their community um, in, you know, in rural Iowa or, you know, Georgia or California. That's not necessarily the case with a bunch of board members who are institutional investors from Wall Street. Th those, those things trickle down. Even today, um, and you talked about the, you know, the real, uh, um, in, in many ways, kind of disastrous squeeze that a lot of the farmers are feeling in certain sectors right now. I'll, I heard Jerry talk about it a couple times from Organic Valley, so I'll just mention an example. I mean, he, he talks about how the board and management at Organic Valley, they have made tough choices across the board to essentially lower the prices for everybody, for their farmers, so that they didn't have to cut off some of their other farmers so that they could get through this hump. That's, that's a type of decision that's, that's um, familiar to co-op and not familiar to C-Corp. So, yeah. Thank you. So Sarah, besides all the meetings, what did you think? It's a, is it a cooperative <laughs> moment? <laughs> Most definitely. Um, I was very excited last week I got to speak um, to a group of business students at GW and to explain about the cooperative business model. And it was exciting and they have a contest at GW where they do something like, um, what do you call it, a shark tank. And the professor told me later that a couple of her students came up to her and said that they were changing their business and they were now going to do it as a cooperative. And so nice. I thought that was, that was great. And I think that, um, you know, we re read about the, the Z generation, you know, you have all these characteristics of all the generations, right? But one of the things that's supposed to be very important for the G Z generation is inclus inclusiveness and equality. And what better business model than the cooperative business model? Um, I just, I think the, the time is right. And educating folks about the model is so important to your, um, comment. You, know, you never, never taught that in economics. Um, one of the things that one of our customer owners, CHS, did a couple of years ago, they actually put together a STEM certified curriculum for high school students 
about the cooperative business model. And it's something that, you know, is, is available for any um, teacher to take. Now, if you, what I learned about high school teachers is that they're pretty overwhelmed. But wouldn't it be great if all the board members of co-ops all across the country adopted a couple of high schools and volunteered to teach a couple of classes about the cooperative business model? The curriculum's there. You know, how can we get the word out? So I'm excited. Nice, thanks. So John, I know you think it's a cooperative moment. For half a century, you've thought it's a cooperative <laughs> moment. So what happens here going forward? How do we make the case to um, younger people? How do we realize the vision that you and your colleagues at the Federation have always held dear in terms of the power of cooperative structure? Well, I, 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 I do believe in cooperatives and I do preach and encourage people to form cooperatives to solve problems that face them in the economy. So I'm still doing that and still encouraging people in that way. The Federation has concentrated on three issues uh, in the last few years. One is helping black farmers and other black people to retain their land ownership. Mm -hmm. That is a big issue about the future and going forward. Secondly, we, our philosophy is to help people to organize cooperatives as, as part of the program and the process to maximize the benefit uh, of their land and do it in a sustainable way. And the third thing is to influence public policy at the local, state, and federal level in support of what we're trying to do. And those things all come together. We, in, in the black community in the South now, about half of the land is owned in an air property status. That is to say, Grandpa died uh, some time back without a will. And because of that, everybody who, in every heir, uh, every sibling, and then their, ch everybody is now has an undivided interest in the land. And, and this has been a problem in seeking uh, various support from the, uh, the government, um, government loan programs, credit programs, conservation programs, marketing programs. Uh, NRCS says, well, unless you can prove to us that you own this land, we are not going to undertake various cost shared conservation steps on your land. So we, in the 2018 Farm Bill, we did get some recognition of this issue of air property and, and some ways to uh, creatively deal with it. And there's also a loan fund, a specific loan fund in there to help families that have air property problems. And we recently, they recently agreed to put a small amount of money in it as, a, as an appropriation and amending the budget. So we'll see where that goes. But all, all of this, 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 all of this is related because if you don't, have ownership of the land or access to the land, then you really can't talk about uh, what you're going to produce and forming an agricultural cooperative to market it or add value to it. So uh, the other programs that we're pushing for are programs to benefit beginning farmers. There are a lot of young people, some of them heirs to the property, 
that really do want to see if they can farm, but they they need, I think, some extra help and guidance, even some hand holding to go to get from where they are to be successful farmers. So we're trying to look at this situation and and really push for this and and coordinate our approach to changing the policy with our uh, direct community organizing and community development efforts. And I would just say on the dairy farmers, I, I, I really think there was a chance to have a better dairy program than what we have in this country. And all of that goes back to people understanding how all this works. So you wind up with a system where the you have these, it, you force people to get bigger and bigger rather than a policy that would help people at a, at a family farm scale. And, and I really think we have to push uh, Congress and the Department of Agriculture to take another look at this because very soon there will not be a future in farming for most people unless the policies are changed. Oh, whoa, on that uplifting note, <laughs> I, I totally agree with you, John. Let me um, turn to the audience now for a few questions for our esteemed panelists. Well, my question, Uh, one, uh, one of your introductory comments, Kathleen, on the on the international aspects of the cooperative business model. Um, could any of the panelists talk about um, uh, what what they see uh, internationally? Is it growing? Uh, are developed countries different from developing countries? Uh, and is there government pushback in certain markets? That's an excellent question. I can speak a little bit about that. We we. At NCB Occlusa, we engage in the international scene in a couple ways. Where there's, of course, there's another association. There's the, the International Cooperative Alliance, and as the the U.S. Apex Association, so we're members of that. So we get exposure and, and um, to uh, to the co-op community on, I'll say, the kind of the global north. I mentioned at NCB Occlusa, we also do a lot of work um, on in developing regions and basically bringing the cooperative principles. Uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Central America. I think the, uh, it's, um, it's very mixed in terms of how much the uh, cooperative business model has been embraced in the success. Generally, in the Global North, um, the experience is pretty close to what we've seen here in terms of particularly with Europe. Um, uh, India, in the last... 52 years or so has become a cooperative absolute powerhouse with agriculture that actually in NCBA Clusa, we, we help start some of the co-ops there. Um, and then in, in, in the developing regions, co-ops have been used as a strategy uh, ever since USAID was created. Some of the first cooperative agreements signed by USAID were, were to do cooperative development. And, and, um, and that work continues today. The I think one, and I'll stop, but the, the one thing, because, you know, cooperatives, um, they are a business model. Uh, many policy makers recognize the special nature of the business model, and there are policies that treat cooperatives in a particular way. Um, and in some countries, you know, they're, it's, it's a more advantageous way or advantageous environment. Uh, and, if, and if you're in a country, just like any other business model, really, on this last comment is, if there's a strong rule of law, um, you know, cooperatives can tend to thrive. If you're in a place where there's not a strong rule of law and, and a high level of corruption, they have a lot of trouble, um, just like any other business model. So I don't know if either of you have any. Okay, other questions? Dan, you're right there. Hi, my name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets ad, uh, advisor in agricultural development. Doug, as you're talking, actually as all of you were talking, uh, I was thinking about uh, the terms that I think about. Mm -hmm. 
when I think about farm ownership, which have to do with cost of capital, leverage, return on invested capital, mm -hmm. and so on. I've been very concerned about institutional ownership, the, the expansion of institutional ownership of farmland, mm -hmm. and have been assured that the representation of institutional ownership is so uh, fractional at this point that doesn't really represent a threat to the concept of farmers being stewards of the land mm -hmm. and farmland being, their, uh, conversely, farmland being owned by bean counters. So while, while I was listening to you talk about the co-op business model, I was wondering if, if you could comment in general on what lending institutions think about when they're presented with um, a request for lending to a co-op versus lending to an institutional investor. And by the way, I make a distinction between institutional investor and corporate ownership of the farm because an institutional investor is going to be an investment company that we would call a hedge fund, and mm -hmm. corporate ownership could just be a very large uh, family owning the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, could, uh, that's my question. Okay. Thanks. I mean, just as, as a lender, you look at the business that's presented to you, and do they have cash flow to pay back the loan? Per period. I mean, the, if, if it's a cooperative model, what are the earnings? What's the cash flow? Are they going to be able to pay back the loan? If it's another model, I mean, it, it's really, from a lender's perspective, it doesn't matter. It, Does it, the co-op have a better I mean, track record? It, it, uh, if, I, if, good, I, yeah. if I might just add yeah. that a little bit, because I've, I've, I've had the experience of working with, in fact, right now, NCBA Clues and a lot of the other cooperative communities working with the Small Business Administration, slightly different, but they, but it, but it is that, and then in some of the ag, credit work um, exposed like how lenders think about the different models, co-op model versus non-co-op model. If, it, it is a special model. It actually, in, in, in fact, even the way that it accumulates capital, its governance structure is special. Um, and if a lender is not familiar with that, they're very reticent to engage. I mean, that's one of the reasons the farm credit system exists um, it's a reason why there's a National Credit Union Administration, you know, um, why there's a Farm Credit Administration, because there's a, there's a different level of, um, well, there, there's a different knowledge set, and, and a lot of it has to do with, with the government structure. Um, and if, if a lender is not familiar with that, then they're going to be reticent and they tend not to lend, and something that I think a lot of co-ops have found over time as... Um, as, you know, independent banks and even regional banks have consolidated. Uh, ag co-ops, they've always banked with co-bank, and then they've, they've maybe banked with another big regional banker. But as those, those regional banks have consolidated, they've, they've sort of, they've lost that person that did the co-op work. And if they don't have somebody who understands the business model, they, they don't engage. So, yeah. so thankfully, the farm credit system is still here. And let me get to it tell you the story of um, the financial crisis in 2008. And mm -hmm. so what happened then was that you had, you know, let's say it's a farmer-owned cooperative. They have a loan with CoBank. We understand agriculture. We understand it's cyclical. Our chief risk officer understands it's cyclical. And more importantly, our regulator knows it's cyclical. <coughs> so the 2008, if you don't flash back to that point in time, we had commodity prices triple. I mean, we had grain elevators that maybe they only needed typically a $5 million line of credit. They needed a $15 million line of credit. The debt equity ratio was way off kilter. Well, CoBank, because it's our mission and we have a whole team, you know, our whole executive team understands that that's our mission. We understood that things were going to be a little off balance for a little bit. We also had a regulator that understood that things were going to be off balance for a little bit. If you had if you were a, a co-op that had a loan with a commercial bank whose chief off risk officer didn't know agriculture, they had a regulator that didn't have the flexibility, they had margin calls. Mm -hmm. And so I just use that as an example of, you know, yes, there are some differences. I guess just kind of got to, back to the fundamental because CoBank, we know co-ops, so we don't think they're anything different. I mean, 
we, we just understand them. So, um, but I just wanted to give you an example of when there was a crisis, why having a cooperative lender was, was really important. Okay, I have two last questions, these two here, and then we're gonna go to uh, the reception and we can all talk. Thank you. Max Finberg, a proud former colleague of both of yours at USDA, but uh, my questions are for both you and John and Sarah. You had mentioned heirs property and the lack of formal title as an institutional barrier, especially that impacts African American farmers and landowners. And I'm wondering, John, if you know of any cooperative efforts to address that in particular. We worked on some at USDA uh, in the last administration. And Sarah, to your point and uh, recognizing that CoBank just has the business perspective of how can we make sure these loans are repaid, is there a growing racial equity lens being applied to that in any way that might recognize some of the institutional challenges that some of these folks face? Well, one thing I just want to highlight that um, regarding black land ownership, CoBank partnered with the rural, um, let's say it was Roanoke Rural Electric Cooperative. Uh -huh. um, they had a matching grant with USDA and CoBank provided that match. And what it did, it helped a team of attorneys go and they worked through the black churches to develop trust to make sure that the black land ownership, they had succession, they had um, a plan for the future. Mm -hmm. So that's something Great. just wanted to brag Great. about. One that. of the first and only rural electric co-ops run by an African Um, so, what we were able to get into the 2018 Farm Bill is a re in those states that have adopted the Uniform Heirs Property Partition Act, and there are about, what, 15 states that have done that, including, surprisingly, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina not Mississippi yet. And so under that law, if you have a majority of the interest, mm -hmm. if you have 51% of the heirs, who 50, if you have the heirs who have 51% or more of the interest, they can petition a court and act uh, as the owners. And the, this in the 2018 Farm Bill, it recognizes those states and that law. It also says we're willing to look at other alternative ways of people showing that they have been, say, farming the land for a long period of time and uh, without having every single heir to sign. The problem was that in, and this, it, it differs in different states and different counties and different offices, they would say, well, you have to have all 23 heirs to sign. In other offices, they said, well, we recognize that you've been the one farming this land for 10 years. We're going to recognize you and give you a farm number. So it was somewhat arbitrary. Under this law, it's clearer. And there is a provision in there for a, a specific uh, revolving loan fund that would allow groups like the Federation to have some resources to help families. Because the, the problem is, with a, there are some people in the family who just don't want to agree on some common plan. And this would allow the resources to uh, buy those people out of the family in an equitable way. The, uh, the other thing is the Federation has tried in some cases to get people to form a family corporation and divorce the actual title to the land 
it, it goes to the corporation or the trust, and that's another way around, uh, you know, where you can make some decisions where you have recalcitrant people in the, I mean, we have had people who signed up for tree planting with NRCS, right? And the, some of the heirs came behind and pull up the trees. Well, that's not a good situation, is it? So hopefully under all of this, things will improve. But if you're talking about the future and you're talking about the next generation of farmers, they really have to have the land, these land tenure things resolved and access to the land very clear. Okay, well, excuse me. I'm going to move on because we have one last question and call me biased, but I'm going to call on Lisa you know, in the back, because she is an ASU graduate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Triple First level, actually. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Pino. It's great to see familiar faces. I'm also a former USDA colleague. But um, to end on a, try to end on a positive note, also forward looking. So I read recently that we need about 700,000 farmers over the next 20 years, which is quite a number. I love Sarah's idea about you know engaging local high schools. How do we, we need, obviously, more younger farmers? But also thinking about um, how women are incredible small business entrepreneurs, and women really know how to get stuff done. Um, is there any way, I don't know if it's groups or resources or even chambers of commerce, is there any way that we can um, think you know more creatively about how to market this occupation, this wonderful career vis-a-vis the co-op mechanism with women, and um, if anything you can share on that point, thanks. Well, I have a couple of ideas. So if you're looking at high schoolers, um, and there's a fabulous program. It's called the Farm to School Network. Um, they're getting more local food into the school system, but it's also just raising awareness of where their food comes from. And it's also an opportunity for people just to get involved. If they don't come from a farm family, you know, how do you get started? How do you get started on maybe an acre of land and start selling locally and seeing if it's for you? Um, that's one pathway. For those schools that have FFA chapters, there's an amazing program. Um, it's a national program called Living to Serve where chapters can apply up to $5,000 in grant dollars to focus on hunger. And that also means mm -hmm. developing community gardens and again, creating those local markets. So I'll just use those two examples. And again, once folks start working in this local food space, when do they realize that they're better, they're stronger together than apart? And when does that create the value for the cooperative business model? Um, I mean, I just think that, that there's an opportunity, but folks just need to know what a co-op actually is. So they know that that's an opportunity. Yeah. I, the, the only thing I would add to that is, first of all, um, Lisa, excellent question, excellent point, and that's something that we're very interested in at NCBA Clusa, and we're looking for ideas. So if anybody in the room has ideas, um, you know, the, the, that, that next generation of cooperators, in this case we're talking about farmers, will not look like the last generation of cooperators necessarily, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, the boardrooms are going to look a lot different. Um, and the general management is going to look a lot different. For people to get on a path of, of being part of a cooperative, they, they have to know about it. The, you know, we've, I'll, I'll just mention we've, a, a, another entry point that we've been talking to is 4-H, which of course these days people in this room know that actually only maybe not even a third of the kids in 4-H are even rural, much less farm. Mm -hmm. And a third are suburban and a third are, are um, you know, so that, so that, that, that cohort, um, trying to bring the scale and, and even Kathleen and I have talked before and I'm going to have more conversations, how to actually get into the, the contemporary network of, of education and outreach. It's a, it's a whole different game, one I'm not expert at, but, but co-ops really need to figure out how to penetrate. So that's a great question. Thank you. All right. So I want to make two, uh, note two things about our reception. One, Suzanne drove to Frederick. Uh, yesterday oh. to go to the Common Market Co-op <laughs> to bring you. back some vegetables because 
we want to be, uh, you know, on message walking here to walk, tonight. Yeah. And uh, Organic Valley sent us a lot of cheese donated to our reception, so we thank them for that. So join us first. Let's recognize our panelists and then join us. <laughs>